Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second installment of the Capitalize for Kids Virtual Cafe. As usual, I screw up my mute unmute. Um, we recognize that you've got many ways to uh, spend an hour of your day, and so we certainly appreciate uh, you spending it with us and our guests for today's session. Uh, the Virtual Cafe is really an opportunity to bring together our two worlds. As you know, Capitalize for Kids works seamlessly across kids' mental health agencies throughout the country to find ways to increase capacity to support more kids and their families. During COVID-19, we, like most, if not all of you, have made significant changes to our business model to deal with the challenges created by this pandemic. With this said, we've been unwavering in our support of our agencies, pulling back on change management and system implementations where required, and accelerating our impact where desired by our agency partners. Our focus during this period of substantial disruption has remained the same. Get more kids and families the mental health the help they need when and where they need it. By engaging through the virtual cafe, we've created an opportunity to explore the two worlds we abut, the healthcare community and kids' mental health in particular, where we deliver those consulting capabilities, and the finance and capital markets community who financially support our organization. We're absolutely delighted to host two leaders in these respective verticals. Alisa Simon, Senior Vice President, Service Innovation and Chief Youth Officer, Kids Health Phone, a healthcare policy expert who has trained and worked for the betterment of kids and their families her entire career. And Alex Rupers, Founder and CIO of Atlantic Investment Management, value investing firm that Alex founded 32 years ago. I'm going to now ask Alex to give some further color on his firm and its investment philosophy, and then I'll be handing it over to Elisa to do the same around Kids Help Home. Alex, over to you. Hey, good morning, and uh, thank you very much, Quinton, for having me on this uh, uh, on this program, if if you will. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and it was my pleasure to be uh, in person there in, uh, I believe, 2016 and 18, and looking forward to being in person there again uh, sometime soon, maybe even later this year. Um, in terms of background, uh, I came from the Netherlands where I grew up. I went to the United States to do my MBA at Harvard in the 80s. Spent time at corporate development, buying and selling companies in the 80s and realized uh, I don't really like illiquidity and I don't really like paying premiums for companies. So I kind of took my toolbox uh, into uh, the public equity market, uh, started Atlantic Investment, uh, kind of pulled it from the ground up. I didn't have any capital or family capital to start it, just the idea and my experience and build it up to a good sized firm, very uh, specialized. I'll go into the uh, into the strategy a little bit more later, but uh, we've been um, you know, very dedicated mid-cap value investors uh, using constructive shelter activism to help uh, companies and their shareholders uh, maximize shareholder value. Thanks, Alec. And now I'll ask Lisa to chime in on an organization that uh, was one of our what I'll call founding organizations that we began our uh, consulting practice with. So, Elisa, over to you. Yeah, so thanks so much for inviting me to be here. Um, so, Kids Help Phone has been around for 31 years uh, and to this day is the only national helpline for young people. We provide 24 7 counseling and support and information uh, to young people from coast to coast to coast in both official languages. Um, and I think that one of the things that makes us unique in the landscape of charities across Canada is we are a very known brand and entity. So when we do um, surveys on um, charities across Canada, what we find is that a huge proportion of Canadians know us and they trust us. But many of them think of us as we were 25 years ago. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last five to 10 years has really been about um, elevating all of our work, innovating, and trying to think what is the role of the charitable sector in true innovation and digital, the digital um, e-health space. And so we now are a place that actively uses AI, that has large data sets, that uses that data for continuous learning, um, with the ultimate vision of the fact that every single young person in Canada um, comes up against challenges, has has distress of different acuity, um, but all of those young people need a safe place to turn and that kids help them can be that safe place 24-7 uh, for young people to reach out and get the support they need. 
So I'll tell you more uh, a little bit later. Perfect. Thanks, Elisa. Um, so now, uh, over in effect, the next 50 minutes, um, we're going to have both of our speakers talk about their respective uh, environments. We're going to have uh, Alex speak about the evolving markets, some implications from COVID-19, then transition to Elisa to focus on those operations and opportunities that could help phone and the mental health care implications of the pandemic. Um, following their talks, I'm going to host a Q&A with the panelists. And uh, this is where we hope uh, all of you at, at, at home in your offices uh, will, get, will get involved. Uh, you're going to have the opportunity to do Q&A. Um, and I'll come back to that, how you can do it, but it's pretty simple. Um, and Sarah Beeson will take the questions and, and feed them into our panelists. Um, so, uh, like all events that we have, uh, we want to get you out of here on time. And so that'll be a 1230 hard stop. So you can plan on that. So now I'd normally ask everyone to give Alex Roopers uh, a really warm welcome, even though he's done his intro. Um, I can hear the clapping uh, in the background. Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Away it goes. Thank you very much. Uh, Quinton, um, I want to make sure RD can hear me. Um, like to share a screen here. Um, hopefully, one second. Make sure I do this right. I believe you can see the presentation. Um, so I want to just go through a few slides, and hopefully, we'll we'll elaborate more in the Q and A session. But um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, it's a firm. I read. I, I started um, in 1988. Uh, we're New York based. We have 20 team members. And we're only public equity, um, have several hundred clients, uh, and invest in a concentrated, limited number of companies. Typically, in the U.S., we're in about um, eight to ten companies. In the in Europe, same thing, and in Japan, uh, we even have uh, some investments in China. The universe uh, is very well defined. Uh, the buy sell discipline is very well defined, and uh, you know we're very much bottom up business owner type investors in our in our companies. Um, the investment team that I've assembled uh, is very long tenured. Uh, many have been with me for uh, you know, 10 to 15 years or more and have a lot of experience prior to uh, joining the team. So we're uh, kind of industrial tourists. Uh, we travel a lot uh, meeting with company managements, uh, maybe not so much in the last three months uh, for all the obvious reasons, but uh, we have our virtual meetings and we'll be back on the road uh, soon enough. Uh, so moving to this uh, next page, it shows you the uh, universe that uh, we deal with. We're not all things to all people. We um, we don't go into very large caps because we feel we want to have an, an edge to our uh, due diligence and uh, meeting with managements uh, one on one. And also being a sizable minority shareholder, typically defined as one to five percent of the outstanding shares of a company uh, and still maintaining good liquidity. So we're staying away from the below one billion dollar category and from the over $20 billion category, mostly for those reasons. Within this size range, uh, there's still about 7,000 uh, companies or 6,500 companies worldwide that fit that size category. Uh, we eliminate some areas that don't uh, lend themselves to concentrated investing or our very uh, deep value bottom-up approach. And uh, also because of the concentration, uh, we want to avoid idiosyncratic areas such as uh, high tech and biotech. Uh, again, these are fantastic areas to invest in. Uh, we all know that, and we wish our clients well uh, as they go into these areas. Uh, but you will not find pure uh, high tech or biotech companies in our portfolio. We avoid companies that uh, have huge product liability uh, risks, uh, where government intervention can be a risk factor, or where it could be a lack of transparency, um, uh, for instance, in banks or brokerage firms or insurance companies. We avoid those areas, and you can see now the 4,000 companies that are remaining. Uh, if you then go to uh, the next uh, set of criteria that uh, boil down our universe, uh, we want reasonably good to very good balance sheets uh, with interest expense less than a quarter of gross EBITDA. Uh, we want always profitable companies, so we avoid uh, pure cyclicals like coal miners, shipbuilders, et cetera. Uh, we want predictable cash flows as much as possible, uh, avoiding uh, companies, for instance, that um, you know, just sell a product and then have to wait for a cyclical recovery, like a furniture company. Whereas in a say an elevator company, you have the maintenance, repair, and overall, and the consumable activities that make it more predictable. Um, we like companies with high barriers to entry, hard to replace assets, etc. All the usual 
good things that you're looking for for fundamentally strong companies. And with those kind of uh, quantitative and qualitative criteria, we come down to maybe 500 names in the US. Uh, again, this has been the universe we focused on. Of course, it changes over time with mergers, acquisitions, IPOs. But generally, this is what we're looking for. Companies in the five to $10 billion category uh, that are consumer and industrial products and services companies with, with good balance sheets. In Europe, there's about 300 of those. In Japan, 250. And in uh, Asia, ex Japan, mostly China, another 350. So that, that's where we spend all our time. We have uh, weekly meetings that we go through. Of course, the, 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 the names that we have, which is typically about you know, 20 core positions globally spread around these, uh, these regions. And then we have a top 20 in each area that we actively monitor uh, companies uh, in that candidate list of top 20 per region. Uh, it's a fluid list, you know, companies go in and out every week almost. Uh, and that kind of gives us our target list of things to do due diligence on and to focus on. So then we go to uh, within the target list and uh, obviously the companies that are in our portfolio, they need to be at the entry level, very attractively valued. Uh, we look very much bottom up to predictable, reliable cash flows. If these kind of companies trade at five or six times um, enterprise value to EBITDA, or maybe seven to eight times enterprise value to EBIT, uh, we get quite excited. Uh, that also equates to about a 10% free cash flow yield. And given the nature of these companies, given our criteria, uh, your downside starts to become pretty well, uh, not protected, but uh, well defined, I should say. Uh, given the, the the solidity of the company and the uh, low valuation that we find as an entry point. So that's where we start scaling in. Typically these uh, buy opportunities occur after a few mishaps, if you will, in the market or in the company itself. We obviously try to analyze those, make sure we understand them, uh, meet with the companies on site and really ramp up the due diligence, uh, not just with the company, but with competitors, peers, uh, consultants, uh, what have you, to get a full picture. Uh, once we've established a good sized position, we certainly roll up our sleeves to become actively involved, but typically we have a 12 to 24 month holding period. Uh, during that period, we are actively sizing the position as a percent of capital. Uh, the more conviction we have, obviously the more uh, percent of capital you would see that is related to the predictability, reliability of the cash flows, as well as how low the valuation is uh, and any specific catalyst that we might see, including ones that we try to uh, organize or instigate ourselves through our activism. Uh, on those moments, we will allocate more to the position. The moment it rallies and it's uh, gone up, we will clip it to keep it in check as a percent of capital. And of course, as it goes further uh, up to our, towards our target, it becomes uh, less compelling from a risk reward pers uh, perspective. And we will start sizing the position down and exit it altogether when we reach our targets or even before we reach our targets, uh, which typically are 10 to 12 times EV to EBIT and eight to nine times EV to EBITDA. So very uh, specific universe, very specific uh, buy sell discipline, uh, largely based on predictable liable cash flows as much as possible. Um, on this page, we talk about our activism. Uh, there's a lot of activists out there. Uh, the the well-known names are well-known for that reason. Uh, we're not so well-known in that sense. We've kept uh, our size in check as a company. Uh, typically it's a two to $4 billion Assets under management is what we have ranged in for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and we will lock uh, or, or stop taking in money when we get to the high end of the range as we've done for many years uh, in the past. Uh, right now, mid cap value has been out of favor for a while and we certainly have capacity, uh, but we're around a billion and a half in AUM currently. But back to the activism. So we want to maintain liquidity at all times. So uh, most activists do engage in activities that reduce their uh, liquidity, for instance, a proxy battle or going on the board of directors themselves or with their team, uh, all these things make them uh, virtual insiders or in, enable to trade. For us, sizing the position, scaling in, scaling out, uh, all these things are very, very important. So we will push uh, for change, uh, do it in a respectful, constructive manner in multiple meetings uh, with management, writing letters uh, to follow up conversations we've had. Obviously, we're testing our ideas with them. Uh, and sometimes with others, uh, we look for win-win proposals in corporate development, unlocking some of the parts of the portfolio of the company, uh, taking winners public or um, you know, terminating or selling uh, companies that have been a drag, operational restructurings, uh, giving them the best in class, operating metrics uh, for working capital, operating profits, and then uh, seeking the 
to have the company uh, develop uh, two or three year plans to achieve those kind of multiples and get a credible roadmap, lay out those roadmaps to other investors with the capital markets days. Uh, and so there's the messaging part, the investor relation part is very important for a public company and we'll help there as much as we can. And then, you know, helping uh, determine what's the best use of free cash flow at any given time could be simply debt repayment, could be share buybacks, dividend increases, M&A, when M&A are happening uh, or, or uh, looked at, we want to make sure that it is done in a very prudent manner and that it competes well with the benefits and the accretion to earnings of uh, share buybacks, for instance. So all those are the kind of conversations we have. And as we have those conversations, we get to know the company better and better and hopefully puts us in a better position to make the right judgment on uh, how much we should have in this company uh, in terms of percent of capital. Uh, we also broaden the conversation with other investors that are either in the stock or could be in the stock uh, and, and any which way we can help the company improve their valuation. So that is the, um, the approach we have. As you can see here, we've been at it for a long time. And this uh, particular uh, slide shows you uh, a lot of the companies we've been 5% plus shareholders in and or uh, very actively, constructively engaged and uh, made a difference in enhancing shareholder value at any given time. You can see here over the decades where we've done that. Uh, just a few words about the uh, overall environment. Uh, the word unprecedented has been abused by everybody. Uh, it is unprecedented, let's face it. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this, uh, both the sharpness of the decline in uh, most equity markets in March in particular, already starting late February. Uh, then the volatility came with it, the retail sales collapse, our lockdowns. Uh, I mean, you, you can name it, it's unbelievable. Clearly we're coming out of it uh, with success, successive lifting of stay at home policies. Very important, uh, we're getting to a recovery. We'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Uh, Q1 earnings season uh, is well behind us now. Uh, we, we've seen that many of our companies have been weathering the storm uh, quite well and that they have solid financials. Uh, but what remains in the market is very interesting because people are, are scratching their heads as to how it's possible that particularly in the US, the markets are near an all time high and yet the main street is hurting a lot with all the unemployment and uh, poor economic uh, numbers still, even though the month on month, month over month, quarter over quarter numbers are starting to look very good. The year over year numbers are still very, very bad. And yet the stock market is at an all time high. How is that possible? And you know, part of that is, of course, that the indexes people look at are market capitalization weighted and are completely dominated by uh, not very economically uh, sensitive companies like Microsoft, Apple, and what have you. Um, and, and they're dominating, and Amazon, dominating these indexes. If you look at uh, most everything that we see in, in the industrial consumer space and mid-cap, most stocks are down between 20, 20 and 60% still after the recovery we've seen in April, May, and June so far. Uh, showing a tremendous pain on earnings and on the share prices. And that's not really reflected in the, the large cap indexes that people look at. Um, just a few uh, slides maybe of interest. Uh, this is the you know, China recovery uh, in some charts. And this shows you the, uh, well, China was first in to the lockdown and the first out. So it's kind of instructive to look at it. And hopefully there's some lessons uh, or some uh, guidance that we can draw from it. But the on the left, you see the congestion index of their top 100 cities. Uh, the dark blue is the uh, 2020 development since the uh, Chinese New Year. So at the, the bottom axis, you see Chinese New Year's the number of days before and after. And Chinese New Year typically is a time uh, when there's not a lot going on in China, except that people are together with their families. And so there's always this dip. You can see the previous years, and then you can see the congestion you know, picking up again fairly quickly after Chinese New Year. And normally, and of course, this time it didn't happen. It took uh, a good two months before it uh, picked up. And now after three months, it's pretty much back to where it was. Uh, hopefully that's an indicator if we start counting from mid-March as to what we have to deal with here. Uh, daily coal consumption, uh, coal you might say is not very uh, popular as a uh, energy generator, but it's still 60, 70% of electricity is generated in China from coal. They're uh, desperately trying to bring it down with uh, alternative energies, but either way, it's a relevant uh, statistic to look at uh, because that shows you the electricity use in China. And again, sim similar pattern, took about uh, three months to get back. And then uh, used car sales in Shanghai, <laughs> just another statistic, huge city. And you can see again, it fell to almost nothing as is typical at Chinese New Year. And then it stayed in lockdown and that too has come back completely. So 
very encouraging signs in the second largest economy in the world uh, with some uh, guidance and lessons for us to uh, look at in our uh, economies as we come out of them. Uh, the equity market dynamic, as I mentioned, very large cap growth uh, out uh, outperformance so far. Uh, clearly, the uh, COVID uh, and lockdown scenario benefited many of the large caps, uh, particularly the FANGs, uh, that stands for Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, and of course, other at home plays, Microsoft, uh, Zoom, uh, Peloton, and many others have gone through the roof. A lot of biotech and healthcare have benefited from this, and all of them. Uh, are in the category of very large caps, mega caps, and in many cases, uh, you also see uh, valuations that make absolutely no sense. People typically just buy stories and don't really care about the, um, uh, the valuation. They just want to make sure these companies are growing, that they're changing the world, and they're doing things for the better, uh, and they're well suited for this environment. And that's all the criteria that matter. And they go, you know, to valuations that certainly don't make any sense to a value investor like ourselves, but. Be it as it may, uh, that has created a huge vacuum and a huge opportunity in the mid-cap mid -cap value territory that uh, we operate in. Uh, we think it is an extraordinary time for investors to take a look at that and maybe diversify a little bit out of their huge winning uh, large cap growth plays and uh, biotech plays to allocate to the industrial consumer products sectors where many companies are well positioned to benefit from the um, unwinding of the lockdown uh, as things go on. Now, if you look at what has typically triggered value uh, to outperform uh, is when the uh, new orders and in industrial uh, sentiment improves, business sentiment has to improve. And there's a chart here. Uh, well, first of all, let you see how fast, you know, earnings have dropped in the cyclical, economically sensitive area and how they've been kind of bouncing back a little bit. And that's compared to what happened in 08, which was uh, very dramatic as well, but more gradual, relatively more gradual. Uh, and here the bounce back could be very quick and very swift. And we're seeing that in many of our companies. And on the right, you see a 12 year chart as to how uh, the um, Institute for Supply Management new orders index uh, has fluctuated, uh, obviously with a big decline uh, in uh, 2008 uh, and 2009 with the great financial crisis, uh, a very steep decline now again with COVID and uh, you can see then the performance of the S&P industrials and how much they track it. So we think there's going to be a very dramatic recovery uh, in those areas. And uh, with that, I think I'm out of my 15 minutes and I'll turn it over back to you, uh, Quinton. Thanks, Alex. Uh, greatly appreciate the insights into Atlantic as well as the market opportunities. So, um, and we'll circle back to you on, on these. I'll, I'll certainly ask you now to put your hands together uh, for Elisa Simon, um, who's gonna take us through a little bit more on uh, Kids Health Phone, Elisa. Great, okay, so let me just start this. Uh, so, uh, hi everybody. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Kids Help Phone, um, who we are, what we do, and then also what it is that we've been seeing through, um, uh, through COVID. So, uh, just to begin with, um, I wanted to give a little bit of a landscape of what um, is happening in mental health in Canada. Um, so we know that there are more than 300 young people um, who are at risk for developing depression every year. Um, the data shows one in five young people are struggling with their mental health. I would actually say that one in one of every person is struggling with different challenges. So we talk a lot about mental health and that is important, um, but the reality is, is that every single young person and every single adult, uh, we face challenges and Kids Help Phone is a place that is there for young people. We say through challenges, big or small, because the reality is, is to that young person, they're all big. Um, we also see that suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people in Canada. Um, I can tell you at Kids Help Phone, we have seen contacts about suicide increase over 100% over the last five years. Um, and so it is something that we remain uh, incredibly concerned about doing a lot of training around um, and really looking for more and more data to be able to determine what we need to do around suicidality. Um, 
In terms of Kids Health Phone, I talked a little bit about who we were at the beginning. Um, we really see ourselves as pioneers in virtual health and e-health solutions. We didn't really know that until a few years ago um, because the reality is, is when we began, we began virtually from the very beginning. Uh, we were there providing counseling over the phone. And through the years, we have changed. Um, we now provide uh, counseling over phone and chat. We provide services over texting. We have a website that is incredibly active with information. Um, we are the largest holder of referrals and resources that young people can access. Um, and we also, as I said earlier, are the only 24 seven um, service available to young people from coast to coast to coast. Uh, in 2019, we supported young people 1.9 million times. Um, in general, when I talk about young people, I'm sort of talking about 5 to 28 or so. Um, we uh, hear from young people reaching out directly to one of our one on one services um, about 1500 times every single day. Um, and of those, we conduct between eight and 10 active rescues every day. And that is when we are unable to keep a young person safe. And so we need to get emergency services to actually go out to that person's house um, in order to keep them safe. Um, one of the things that has been incredibly impactful over the last few years, in 2018, we launched Canada's first national texting service. Um, and it really required a change in our thinking because um, prior to that, for many years, Kids Health Fund, if you asked us who we were, we would say that we are paid professional counseling service for young people. And that was something that we're incredibly um, proud of, that young people have access to professional counselors 24-7. But one of the challenges was around scalability and how do we get to 1.9 million interactions and how do we get beyond that? And so in 2018, we launched a texting service that changed our model um, for that service from paid professional counselors to trained volunteers who are overseen in real time by paid professionals. And so that service um, launched in 2018 as a pilot in the province of Manitoba. And in the last uh, two years, we have trained thousands and thousands of Canadians to be volunteers for that. Um, we currently have 1,500 volunteers that are active every 30 days on that platform. And we have taken over 220,000 conversations. Um, that service is growing very, very rapidly. Um, a few interesting things about that. Uh, this year, we also launched that service for adults just a few weeks ago because we realized there was a huge gap in services and supports available for Canadians. And so now adults can also reach out to our texting service. And one of the things that we find is about 80% of people that reach out to Kids Health Phone in general say that if we had not been around, they would have done nothing else. They wouldn't have talked to anybody else. Um, they would have ignored the problem. They would have hoped that it went away. Um, in addition, about 11% of the people that uh, connect with us say that if they hadn't been able to reach out, they would have had to go to the emergency room. Um, and so we see a tremendous need for this service. I also will say we do a lot of evaluation because it's really important that you understand what it is that you're doing well. So we look at how our service is helping to decrease distress, increase confidence and clarity, uh, as well as satisfaction rates. So when we started the texting service, um, what we were looking at, as I said, is how do we develop scalable models in order to meet um, an increasing demand that we see across Canada? And that really was the beginning to what we call our innovation imperative, that we needed to look at new models of service that were going to change the landscape and to mobilize Canada around new service um, points, new entree points, and look at um, it on a continuum of services for different levels of acuity. So this was what our services looked like last year, and it is still the way that they look in terms of our professional counseling being for um, what we consider sort of the highest acute needs, um, but it actually is only about 10% of the young people that come to us and yet mirroring what we see in the physical health space and in hospitals, uh, it takes up the vast majority of our budget because it's an incredibly expensive service. And yet 90% of our services, or excuse me, 90% of our users are coming to um, our paraprofessional support, our texting or our website, um, where we know that we could do a huge amount of work to be able to better support young people. 
So we took this model of what our current services are, and we put a lens of innovation scalability on that, along with um, figuring out from young people and youth engagement um, what it is that would meet their needs. And we built out um, a new pyramid. Uh, and this pyramid is interesting because it is both a pyramid, but it is also what we call a stepped care solution. And so you can also see this on a slide where things are stepping up in acuity. And the idea is that we move to have many more points of access. Um, so we are looking right now at building out a peer to peer support service that we will be launching at the end of this year. Um, we are looking at lots of um, content on our website that is not only reading about topics, but how do we leverage apps and tools that are either already created and being used and have been validated or that we can create on our website. We are building out a navigation bot right now because one of the big challenges when you're in distress is coming either to Google and getting 5 million different uh, resources or coming to a website like Kids Help Phone where again, you're not sort of targeted to directly what would be most helpful. And so we're building out a navigation um, bot that will help young people get to exactly the support or service that will be useful um, with an entire navigation program or AI bot program behind that because we see a lot of different use cases for that bot, uh, including using it in um, our chat queue or in our texting queue so that young people, while they're waiting to connect one-on-one, -on -one, could potentially be having conversations um, and reducing distress. Um, and so this has become a huge business plan with lots of different opportunities for innovating our current services and new services. And then behind all of this is a huge amount of data. And so um, one of the things that makes Kids Help Phone unique is that every single day we are talking to large numbers of young people. Um, and as a result, we have large amounts of data. And that data includes um, quantitative data. Uh, what is it that young people are talking about? What do they say they're talking about? So young people fill out surveys and information, as well as what do the frontline service providers say young people are talking about? Uh, it includes demographic data, but it also includes transcripts. And so we have a tremendous, um, and we would say probably the largest unstructured data set in Canada on youth mental health. And so how do we leverage these things, build, bringing all of our data together so that we can be looking at service improvements, at trends, um, at policy? How should we be spending money around youth mental health? Um, and then how do we use that data to um, fuel up the AI that we use at Kids Help Phone as well as potential other AI opportunities? Now, the reality is that we are a charity, right? And so. Um, we are not known in the charitable sector often for our innovation around data and data engineers. And, um, and so this is an area that we are building up right now in hiring um, the right people to be able to leverage this data um, and to build up our data hub. And we also work in partnership with a lot of others that have this capability, um, but see a need to partner with charities in order to have scalability and real impact um, from the kind of data. Uh, and an example that I would say of where this data becomes really powerful, if you um, remember before I was talking about suicidality in Canada, well, most of our data around suicide is old and it comes from coroner's reports and death records and hospitalizations. But we know that's only a slice of suicidality in Canada. Um, and so we want to better understand that issue along with many other issues by not only looking at what are young people talking about today, what's the impact of things like COVID or flooding or other events that are occurring, um, but also what are the changes over time and can we build out predictive models? So in terms of COVID, this is just a little bit of a snapshot. Uh, Kids Help Phone has seen um, over 110% increase in demand for our services since the beginning of COVID. Um, and so we count that as March 12th, which is really when for most young people, this became a reality across Canada. And as you can see, we have seen an increase in a lot of um, conversation topics, uh, particularly eating and body issues and images has been something that we've seen a large increase in, but also isolation and grief, which makes sense, um, given that we often are stuck in our homes. Um, 
The other thing I want to point out is around abuse and neglect. So a 30 plus percent increase around all of the different types of abuse. This is actually important because what we've seen across Canada is that child welfare systems have seen a decrease in reporting about abuse and neglect. Um, and we believe that is mostly due to the fact that one of the big reporting places across Canada is schools. And so with schools closed, young people are not having reports made to the child welfare system. But as we can see, they are still experiencing abuse and neglect in very high numbers. Um, one of the good news stories coming out of this is while suicide has continued to be a large percentage of the contacts that we get at Kids Health Phone, it has not increased. Um, during the time of COVID, as we've seen other issues increase. And so our goal right now is that we would be moving from the 1.9 million interactions that we had last year to 4 million by 2025. Um, I actually think we can do more than that. Um, I really stand behind the idea that it takes a huge amount of courage for young people to reach out and that our job at Kids Health Phone is to ensure that every single young person that has th that courage, that says that they need help, they need to talk through something, they need to process something, they need to practice, that every single one of those people receives the answer they need um, and the support that they need. And so we believe that that number will probably be higher than 4 million when we look at the kinds of challenges that young people are facing across the country. And so that is the end of, of my presentation, and I look forward to uh, to Congress to uh, being able to talk more. And thank you, Lisa. I greatly appreciate uh, that backdrop to Kids Help Phone. Um, now that the presentations have concluded, uh, it's the opportunity to turn this into a Q and A. Um, and as I suggested earlier, we'd love uh, for you, as the audience, to post uh, questions. Uh, into the question uh, box on the right hand, what should be on the right hand side of your screen. Note that the questions will only be seen and they're anonymous into uh, Sarah Beeson, who will be uh, collecting, uh, collating, grouping um, in order to be able to deliver them uh, to our panelists. So uh, take note of that. Um, I'm going to get the uh, party started with a couple of questions. Um, that I actually asked at the first uh, virtual cafe. Um, and so I, I thought, let's hear uh, whether there's some consistency around how, how you guys are viewing things. Um, the last 13 weeks, as I've uh, thought about it, uh, there's been uh, a time of panic and then hope thematically uh, across healthcare sectors uh, as well as the investment environment. Um, and so I'd like to hear from you guys how, how you think about this playing out. Are we past the panic stage truly um, and into an arena of uh, hope and opportunity? Um, or is there more to come? Um, and, you know, uh, you know, these the talk of second waves of uh, the pandemic and third waves of the pandemic, relatively speaking, in your respective verticals. So, um, you know, I'd love it if you could give me a little bit of view. I'll, I'll actually ask Alex uh, to wade in first, um, and then we'll we'll switch it over to Elisa. Yeah, thank you, uh, Quentin. And uh, on, on that subject of panic and hope, uh, clearly uh, we all watch TV, and uh, TV has, uh, as always, uh, focuses on there's a house on fire. It will show that on TV, and the million houses that are not on fire are not shown. And uh, when somebody is very ill or some accident happens that's shown on TV and the ones who are not ill are, is not shown. Doesn't mean there's no others out there, but uh, there's a huge slant in the news media and the uh, television uh, towards what's wrong and what's not well, uh, because that sells and that's what attracts people to the TV. And I think uh, that combined uh, with a lot of misunderstandings that, of course, everybody had, I'm not blaming anybody, but from World Health to CDC, and others, uh, not to belittle the uh, severity of the of the COVID crisis, uh, I think we're definitely past the worst as a result of uh, what we're seeing in terms of medical improvements, obviously the uh, flattening of the curve, and also the fact that as a society, uh, this is probably the last pandemic that we have been unprepared for. I mean, this kind of hit us with a two by four, not so much in Singapore and Hong Kong or China where they've dealt with SARS and other serious things head on. And they have a lot of discipline uh, that comes from the top. Uh, here, we didn't have so much, and there was a lot of misinformation, and it did uh, get out of control uh, for a while. But the scenarios that were thrown around 
in mid-March were a complete buckling of the healthcare system and millions of deaths. Uh, and clearly we're now three months later and uh, there's an underutilization of most healthcare assets and uh, the, the rate of uh, spread and the, the, the death rate has certainly come down. And there's a lot more understanding. And of course, we're getting closer to uh, medical solutions as well as uh, vaccines. So I think we're definitely past the worst. I, I do believe if you look at the unemployment situation, for instance, in the US, as severe and as rapid as it is or was uh, and still is, uh, I think we'll see uh, dramatic improvements month over month, quarter over quarter. Uh, but there will be changes. I mean, there's changes how we live, there's changes how uh, things uh, operate from a work life perspective, how we think about things. Uh, we also uh, start thinking about, you know, uh, our, our fellow citizens and those in need. And so back to your cause and Alicia's cause, uh, th there's, I think, more focus and more reflection by a lot of people that are maybe so more business oriented entirely to, to broaden out and give that a lot more thought and more time and, uh, and more support. Thanks, Alex. Um, Lisa, do you think, um, you know, the, the panic and the evolving nature of the pandemic, you, you've got a bunch of stats in, into how Kids Help Phone has been impacted, and you said suicide, suicidality looks like it's come down in terms of the impact. So, how, how has this played into what you're, you think you're seeing relative to the data? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we can certainly say is that all of our lives have been changed. Um, and for most young people across Canada, they are having this impact, not only because it's impacting their immediate life of not being in school, not being able to see their friends, but young people also observe the adults in their life, right? And so as we see adults that are losing their jobs, um, that are concerned about their health, concerned about um, grandparents or parents. All of that has a ripple effect on young people. And that ripple effect, I think, goes through a lot of different waves. Like for some young people, school hasn't been a favorite place for them to be. And so getting to be at home with their parents can be great. Um, some people have backyards where they love to spend time. Um, for other young people, this has been incredibly challenging. They are in situations with families in small houses or apartments. Um, they might be experiencing abuse and neglect. Um, and I think that the important thing about this is, first of all, it's not just COVID that we're all dealing with. We also are dealing with the impacts of that. We're also dealing with a huge amount of um, unrest right now about the systemic racism across Canada and in the US. We're seeing that, um, I mean, at Kids Help Phone, we're seeing an increase in contacts about racism right now. We see that young people that reach out about racism are some of the most distressed users of our service and are the most likely to be talking about suicide, for example. So there's a lot happening right now in the world that's impacting young people. Um, and I would say that the impact isn't going to end. This is an ongoing evolution. We're now starting to hear from people talking about being afraid when things do open up more and more. What is it going to be like to go back into school in the fall? And we don't know. Are young people going to be going back full time? Are they going to be in classrooms? Um, and so we're in a time of huge uncertainty. And for us, as people, and for young people in particular, it's hard to think through that uncertainty. Um, and to know how we're going to come out of this. Um, and so to me, a lot of our work is really remaining, helping people remain in the present to be okay with being concerned about that uncertainty and coming up with small little steps that you can take to better your well being, to find some joy, um, things like that. But I think we're going to be grappling this with, uh, with this for quite a time. You, you mentioned earlier, um, Lisa, this notion of, you know, you guys have are not known or wouldn't be automatically be known for big data, AI, the investment into that. Um, and then you think about what's been happening during the pandemic, uh, fundraising being challenged in some arenas, um, et cetera. So when you think about operating in the current environment and you're contemplating investing, which it's help phone has done, do you continue to invest with the view that, look, this, you know, whether it's, COVID or anything else, it'll continue to be impactful. We gotta we gotta make changes, we gotta develop, we gotta innovate. So you continue to spend money, or do you back off 
conserve cash, create a little bit of dry powder, ensure you can make it through and, and, and wait for better times, better times perhaps on the fundraising side. And then there's a natural segue over to Alex around how he thinks about his investment. Yeah, I mean, I would say certainly the charitable sector has been um, hit pretty hard by COVID and um, many are having real challenges around donations. Um, Kids Help Phone, we have our largest fundraiser every May, which is the Walk So Kids Can Talk. Um, and it is our not only our largest fundraiser, but it's also our largest um, way to have unrestricted funds. And we knew pretty, uh, you know, April that that was not going to be able to happen. And so we had to pivot and determine how are we going to engage people across Canada in our cause. Um, we also have made real changes in our government relations and in understanding the important role that governments play, that Kids Help Home really is an essential service as the front line for young people across this country. Um, and so we've been able to work with government partners, um, both federally and at the provincial and territorial level, uh, to support the work that we do. But I would say that our number one goal over the last three months has been uninterrupted service that we wanted to ensure through moving everybody home, through all of the uncertainty of what was going to be happening, that we never had a moment where our service was down so that young people could continue to reach out. And with an eye to the future, that decisions that we're making right now have to set us up for that future to get to that 4 million um, and more. So we have to be thinking both short-term, but also long-term because the reality is that um, as I was saying, these challenges are going to be continuing, and we see the need for the kinds of supports and services that Kids Help Phone provides to be growing as we find new entree points. So how do, for example, how do we get to social media where young people are spending their times or gaming sites instead of making young people uh, end whatever they usually are doing when they want to reach out for help? So there's a lot of work that needs to happen to make sure these supports are sort of omnipresent in young people's lives. Thanks, Lisa. Alex, I mean, one of your investment philosophies is strong balance sheets. Um, and so in this kind of environment, do you encourage your management teams as you as you go through your activism uh, to be focused on investing in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty? Or do you say conserve the cash and let's let's wait? Yeah, <laughs> clearly, uh, you know, everybody was hit with such a ton of bricks of uncertainty that uh, the, the immediate reaction was for everybody to pull back on uh, capex uh, capital spending projects. In some cases, they could not be completed because people couldn't travel to the sites to complete a plant or what have you. So there's some natural um, you know, reduction in capital spending and then there's forced capital uh, spending reduction. Uh, we would encourage that for the time being, uh, other than of course, completing projects that were there to the extent possible. Uh, a number of companies, quite a few companies, have either suspended or cut their dividends, even though it was not entirely needed for, on the service of it. Uh, but we actually uh, were, were fine with that as well. Suspended uh, share buybacks and pulled on their credit line. So that was the immediate reaction. We're seeing now two or three months later, having come past some reporting and seeing more visibility into the, um, well, clearly the end of the second quarter, now into the, into the second half of 2000. Um, and 20 that companies are repaying some of these uh, credit lines, bringing the balance sheet uh, back to normal and going back kind of back to normal. I mean, the, the underlying assumption we're using here is that uh, 2021 will look uh, quite a bit like 2019 economically minus zero to five percent, depending uh, on the sector and the, uh, the types of companies we're dealing with. Uh, that means that they basically want to go back on track. But for a moment there, a moment being a couple of months, People clearly pulled back, conserved cash, uh, like almost anybody does, a household or um, uh, a charity or a museum, anybody would do that uh, just to, to see how it all looks. As far as the second wave, uh, we are uh, clearly all aware of that. We want to maintain the good uh, habits that we've been taught, uh, social distancing, uh, kind of a hybrid approach to getting back to the office and into um, social settings. And I think that will help us all well. And of course, by then, more people have immunity, uh, there's more treatments, uh, the hospital system is recovered. So uh, I'm quite positive on how things are going to shape up uh, in the, the coming months and quarters. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Beeson, who's got some uh, Q&A coming from our audience. Sarah? Great. Thank you, Quentin. 
Uh, so I do have a few questions that have come in from the audience here. Uh, so we have one uh, audience member asking, uh, she's coming from a community-based team supporting Indigenous youth health. So this question is for Elisa. Does Kids Help Phone collect information on Indigenous child and youth needs? And are the number of users representative of the estimated number of Indigenous youth in Canada? Uh, thank you. Such an important uh, question. So um, I want to begin by saying uh, that, yes, we do serve quite a number of Indigenous youth and we serve the percentage um, uh, that is in the population. So when we look percentage wise, but we also know that that is not nearly enough. And so um, last year, Kids Help Phone decided that we needed to really put a stake in the ground to what our role was within reconciliation and what our role was as a um, organization that is there for Indigenous youth. And so we actually um, developed a Indigenous Council at Kids Help Phone that is made up of Indigenous people from across the country, 50% of whom are youth, um, one of whom has a seat on our board. And they developed our Indigenous Action Plan, which is a list of actions that they want Kids Help Phone to take in order to ensure that our services um, are safe that they speak to Indigenous youth, that we diversify our staff, um, that everybody is trained. And so we are now on a real um, path of trying to meet all of these actions. And that, um, that action plan is available on our website, and I can also share it uh, with the Capitalize for Kids folks to send out. But that was a real turning point for us in understanding that we actually need to do a lot more um, around supporting Indigenous youth. We're doing the same thing right now around um, supporting Black youth across Canada. Um, and uh, the last thing that I would say is then we also do have data about our service and how it is working um, for Indigenous youth. And so there's a lot of work to be done with Indigenous organizations and partners around the use of that data, given what's um, laid out within Truth and Reconciliation and the fact that that data is actually owned by Indigenous people themselves. Um, and so I would say we uh, we took a lot of big steps last year, but there's still a significant amount of work for us to do um, that we'll be doing over this year and in the coming years. Great, thank you. Um, this question is for both of you. Uh, obviously, we're talking about two very different sectors uh, with their own very different problems. One of our audience members would like to hear both panelists' views on the paths to reopening post-COVID. Who do you think is benefiting and who could we be harming from your respective viewpoints? Uh, we can start with Alex. I'm not sure I got the entirety of the last uh, question. So who is benefiting and who is of the, of the reopening? Oh, who is this benefiting and who could we be harming? While reopening. While reopening, correct. Um, good question. Uh, I think a lot of people benefit from reopening. Um, I think uh, everybody wants to get back to work and back to normal life. So I think it's, uh, it's all good. The only thing you could have is, again, the, 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 the chance for uh, a, a second wave, which I really don't think is going to be huge in magnitude, but time will tell. Uh, there's no way to know that for certain. So I think we need to, uh, to be careful in that sense. I think for kids who don't like to go to school, uh, they're probably not happy to go to school uh, again. But uh, I think everybody would love to see schools open in a normal fashion as much as possible. Uh, in Europe, there's a number of good examples in Denmark and the Netherlands, uh, my home country, how things are going in, in that respect uh, with some new rules that we all should um, uh, heed uh, carefully. So I, I think net net it's a real win win story for everybody. Great, thank you. And Elisa? So I would say that we uh, need to be building a significant amount of supports for young people as we think about reopening. We now have a group of young people that have anxieties and distress of things that we would have never imagined uh, a few months ago. So that is young people who now um, are afraid to leave their house because they hear about coronavirus and they're afraid they're going to get sick. Um, that is young people who are afraid about what is gonna happen when they go back to school. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty among young people, even though the idea of reopening and being able to see friends, for example, is really exciting for a lot of young people. There's also a huge amount of unfair and uncertainty. And so we have to recognize that 
Um, and I can even say, I mean, you know, as someone who has gotten, you know, when I first started working for home, I was like, oh, how am I going to do this? And now I'm like, how am I going to get on public transportation and go into the office every day? What is that going to mean? How do I keep myself safe when I'm doing that? Um, so I do think that while it is a good news story that we think about reopening, we also need to think about the impact of the last few months and the coming months and the impact of these changes. Every time we make these changes, there is an emotional impact and particularly for young people. Um, so the big thing that I would say is um, we should continue to expect that young people are gonna be struggling with these changes, even the good ones. Um, we're gonna continue to see young people that are having challenges processing through what this means for them. And we need to make sure that supports are available for every single one of them um, and for adults as well as we all try and um, deal with this, the good news of things reopening. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Quentin. Alex, I just wondered if uh, there was any part of your portfolio that you would highlight to, that could benefit as a result of, you know, let's say heightened security, you know, changes in our environment that we're going to sustain as a result of uh, this pandemic. Yeah, like most uh, active fund managers, uh, we we obviously try to assess. Uh, rapid changes in the environment uh, as to what it will do to our existing holdings and what what other holdings we might want to have that become available at attractive prices. And uh, clearly, we've made uh, quite a few trades and changes to our portfolio, and uh, some we were in that uh, still got hit on the share price. And the initial uncertainty uh, are ones that are benefiting quite a bit. I'm, I'm flagging two companies in Europe actually, but they're global in nature. Uh, one is a Danish company called ISS. Uh, that is kind of like an ARA market. 80% uh, of business is involved in office cleaning and office uh, maintenance. And uh, they've come out, uh, you know, with something called pure space, uh, which is a 360 degree, if you will, or a full turnkey service for offices to create confidence in workers to come back uh, with high touch cleaning, sophisticated technologies they have to and, and services and well-trained forces to go in and to do this extra work over and above the normal office cleaning. Uh, and I think that is what we all want to see. We, we want to have confidence to go back to our uh, spaces, it's office or school buildings, what have you. And so ISS clearly seeing a pickup in activity or uh, and then more content, if you will, per customer as a result of this uh, pandemic and the new environment that we find ourselves in. Uh, another company that uh, we have is a company called G4S. Uh, which competes globally with a company called Securitas. And these are large providers of, um, you know, of uniformed security people that help secure perimeters of uh, embassies, uh, corporate headquarters, government buildings, uh, monuments, uh, but also they help provide security at uh, conventions, uh, rock concerts, et cetera. Uh, clearly they have also been hit in their share prices and in their activity levels, but uh, what we found uh, we're involved in, in G4S, the English company, which has, by the way, 570,000 people on their payrolls, that their total sales for the first five months of this year were only down 1%. And that includes a business that is small for them, uh, that is quite cyclical, that's cash transport, uh, which is like Brinks kind of business. In fact, they sold most of their business to Brinks right before the pandemic, which was a good thing. And we were kind of involved with that uh, because we thought it was a, a good thing to do. But anyway, the um, uh, and not to to make anything light of the, the the riots, of course, are a terrible thing that that happened, and the inequality that's going on that led to that. But uh, clearly, the world isn't getting any safer. Uh, hostels need more security. Uh, monuments need more security. Government buildings need security. Uh, people are talking about defunding the police. Well, who's going to step into the void? There need to be private security companies. So uh, we think that that is a good area uh, where these folks can provide qualified uh, personnel for uh, specific jobs and, and clearly it's also a great employer you know they, they've been hiring a lot of people during this period when there's so much unemployment perfect uh, thank you i i think um i'm going to you know, given it's uh 12 29 um i did promise that we'd finish on time uh we pride ourselves on that so i i want to take this opportunity to say uh elisa uh, thank you so much for being on uh, our, our uh, virtual cafe number two. 
uh, we, we believe uh, Kids Help Phone is a vital service uh, across uh, our country. Uh, we're very proud to have uh, supported uh, Kids Help Phone in, in parts of your business and developing a project management office. Um, and uh, it delights us to see kind of the impact and the success that you guys continue to have. So uh, thank you very much. And then Alex, uh, uh, you have been a big supporter of uh, Capitalize for Kids. Uh, you uh, are willing to show up at our October conferences, uh, which we're delighted by. Um, we've had a tremendous track record, obviously. Um, it's been an interesting experience, uh, you know, for the value value investor relative to momentum, but no doubt uh, that that too shall turn. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in October. Uh, we really appreciate you having spent your time today. So for the audience, thanks again for joining us for the second uh, virtual cafe. We look forward to seeing you in the very near future. Thanks all. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you. Bye now. Cool. Thank you.